So welcome to this um, uh, event with um, award-winning ju tech journalists in <laughs> Indonesia, Nadine Freyslad, uh, a knowledge partner at uh, the Nordic Chamber in Indonesia, and legendary entrepreneur and uh, venture capitalist, Will Klipken. And we're doing this event together with the Norwegian Hello. Business Association Hello. in Singapore. Uh, our friends, Norwegian friends, Norwegian businesses in Singapore. <clears throat> and um, today we're going to talk about the Gojek and Tokopedia merger and, and many other exciting topics. Um, <clears throat> we're going to record this uh, session and uh, we're going to record um, the whole thing. And we might uh, edit away parts uh, if necessary later. Um, Nadine will do a presentation first, then then um, we will open for questions. And there's two ways to ask questions. You can post a question in the Q&A box, or you can raise your hand, press the raise hand button. If you raise your hand, we will prioritize you because it's nice to hear other people's voices, although we all love our, to hear our own voices, of course. Um, <clears throat> so with that said, uh, I um, welcome you to start, uh, Nadine, whenever you're ready. Sure, sure. Thanks, Magnus, and uh, hi, Will, and yeah, it's nice to, to be back again. It's, it's been a bit of a break since we had our last session here. Um, and for those of you who are new to the session, you know, uh, yeah, as Magnus said, I'm, I'm a journalist covering the digital economy here in Indonesia for a publication called The Ken, um, where we, you know, publish just one original story a day. So it's kind of a slow journalism concept rather than uh, doing fast and breaking news. Um, and we have a daily newsletter and a weekly newsletter. So there's many ways of connecting with us at the CAN. That's just like the preamble. And as usual, I have uh, this uh, setup where I have four segments in the presentation. I do a quick update on tech startup funding rounds that have happened in the past few weeks or months. I usually look at tech related policies. In this case, we are going to talk about the minister regulation number five. That's been a bit of a controversy of late here in Indonesia and that I get asked about a lot. And then, uh, yeah, in the third segment, you know, we'll get to the meaty stuff, which is the big news of the past couple of weeks. Grabs, spec, merger, the deal between Go Gojek and Tokopedia, and the domestic uh, exchange, the IDX, which is preparing or, you know, desperately angling for uh, getting the local unicorns to list there. And then instead of the trends and predictions segment, we'll have, you know, time for a longer Q&A session with with Will, who's, uh, who's joining today as a special guest. Okay, I'm gonna get started with this one. So um, because we've missed a couple of months now, I just collected the larger rounds from the months March, March to June. Um, we've had the funding of Halodoc, a telehealth medicine platform that's affiliated with, um, with Gojek. Um, raising 80 million and it's quite obvious that health related platforms have had you know an important role to play and during the pandemic Holodoc was involved with uh, not only uh, setting up telemedicine specific to COVID uh, related symptoms and coaching or like uh, yeah just educating its doctors on how to help uh, people who were self-isolating at home through that process um, and they did were highly involved in setting up uh, vaccination centers, medicine delivery and so forth. So yeah, I'm, I'm actually surprised uh, telemedicine or the health tech space is still relatively sort of below the radar in Indonesia. I do think that's that's going to change over time. Uh, next is a startup called Super that's active mostly in Eastern uh, Java. 
I think Surabaya is the headquarters. Maybe that's why, you know, I hadn't really heard the name much before. It's not a brand that you would see in day-to-day -day life in, in Jakarta, but it's a social commerce startup. There is a bunch of those at the moment trying this concept. Um, and the idea is basically um, you, you get several people to bulk order a certain product so that then the cost of distributing it becomes cheaper. And uh, yeah, there's just various models that are iterating around this idea <clears throat> because of course, um, you know, logistics in a country like Indonesia is always going to be a cost factor. So it needs to, there needs to be innovative ways to, to reduce those costs. Uh, Bibit uh, is certainly one company that benefited from the craze on the on the stock markets and that so many new retail investors signed up um, in Indonesia. So Bibit, the robo-advisor platform, raised a huge round. Um, Amarta has been around for a long time in the what's called P2P lending, but is actually like more like B2P lending because uh, it's often uh, banks and other institutional uh, lenders who are providing the, the funds to small businesses. Um, then we have Buku Kas, uh, which along with Buku Warung are startups in the category of MSME bookkeeping. That's basically software that would help someone who, let's say, owns a little warung, you know, a retail shop, uh, side of the street kind of mini retail shop where you can buy just drinks, cigarettes, and the daily needs goods, um, you know, bringing those uh, online in the sense of giving them some simple software tools that they can use to improve their operations. Tani Hub is a uh, agri-tech platform that's doing fruits and vegetables, uh, also lending to farmers who farm these fruits and vegetables and also doing the distribution. So this is an agri-tech model that's become kind of the way things are done in Indonesia. It's not only just one thing that you do, let's say just like getting the fruits and vegetables to the consumer. No, it's you have to do the full stack, you know, from actually uh, lending money and bringing um, in things like uh, um, fertilizer to to these farmers. So yeah, that's what Tani Hub has been doing and hence uh, raising pretty huge amounts of uh, money as well. And then there's Ruanguru, the ad tech platform that's similarly playing in all uh, areas of the ad tech industry. It's doing a platform for tutoring. It's doing some sort of software for schools where they can keep track of uh, their classes and teachers and expenses. And it's also got an arm for what's called like doubt solving. It's basically homework help where students can log in and get someone to quickly uh, coach them through specific homework type of problems. Yep, that's just the roundup of uh, who raised funding in the recent months. And, you know, usually this gives you a little bit of a peek into up, up and coming trends, you know, which verticals are becoming more important in Indonesia at the moment. On the policy update, I don't know how interesting that the details of this specifically are to you guys, but I have been asked about what this means. And it's basically a, you know, a minister level regulation that wants all private electronic system operators that are available here in Indonesia that could, you know, in theory mean every little website, every little blog that Indonesians can access uh, to, to register in Indonesia. And the purpose is to make them um, subject to the domestic uh, regulations. Um, and part of that request in the regulation is that the government get access to data, user data, um, and have influence on, on content uh, upon request. And 
you know, this this has obviously been widely criticized, not only for the way it uh, limits, you know, potentially limits freedom of expression, et cetera, et cetera, but also that it's just kind of very, very impractical and that um, it, you know, to, to many who are criticizing this, it just shows how little uh, understanding the Ministry for Information still has about, you know, constructing actually implementable regulations. Um, yeah, while all at the same time, Indonesia is still working on its personal data protection regulation. So, you know, the absence of that while pushing for this uh, really makes very little sense. And, oh, sorry, that's a bit of a wall of text here, but my takeaway from this is, you know, the, the deadline for this regulation that was supposed to go into, uh, into effect already has been postponed. And my feeling is, as we've already seen before with other attempts like this, is that it'll get postponed again, somehow watered down and changed again, because the regulation is just, um, I think, very poorly, poorly set up and was very poorly communicated and isn't really in harmony with other existing rules. But if Indonesia has its way and, you know, they do require more and more mid or even small sized operators to register and make certain data available to the Indonesian government, the effect could very well be that those companies just decide it's no longer worth to serve Indonesian users. And to some degree, we already see where like Vimeo or Reddit, that they just, um, you know, accept Indonesia's uh, blocking. Uh, and, you know, that, yeah, we could, we could just have more and more gaps like that in, in our open internet here. That's the danger. But my takeaway from the, where we are at now is that this is still going to be a drawn out uh, situation. I don't expect this to happen very fast. Okay, so we come to the part where, you know, we get to the meat of the stories. Um, oh, yeah, so another thing, like, you know, I obviously can't talk too much in detail in this presentation, but we do usually always have stories on the can about this as well. So in this segment, I usually explore stories that we've written in more detail on our website. Um, on the grabs back, which was probably big news just a few weeks ago. Um, I'll quickly take you through the basics again of what is this spec. I don't know, maybe all you guys are already quite familiar with it, but just in case. Um, again, you know, it's a, it's a blank check company that usually is started by investors who have a certain reputation, who, who can draw up interest in, in this vehicle and um, the company itself doesn't have commercial operations of its own. This blank check company's only purpose is to raise money through an IPO. And then, you know, they, they say uh, that they are looking for a certain target company who they, which they intend to acquire. Um, and people who back the initial IPO of this blank check company, they get a so-called warrant that means, you know, if they in the end like the target company that the blank check company has identified and agreed to merge with, then they become uh, shareholders or stockholders of that new uh, target company. Um, yeah, so, you know, once the target is identified, a reverse merger happens and the target company becomes the listed entity. So in the case of Grab, you know, the blank check company's name is Altimeter, um, Altimeter Growth. And uh, at the moment, it's still listed on the NASDAQ as Altimeter. But once they've completed, completely completed that reverse merger pro process, uh, that entity will then be called Grab also on the NASDAQ. And What's happened for Grab is that it was just a very quick way to get listed. Um, 
from estimates I've heard is that it kind of saves four to five months or perhaps even more of an of, of an or of a traditional IPO timeline because for a traditional IPO the company itself in this case Grab would have had to do the whole like investor roadshow it would have to disclose a lot of financial information fill out a lot of forms with the SEC and so on and so forth and this basically uh, it's just a vehicle to to skip a little bit of that process and the reason why it's become so popular to do this is you know once yeah COVID travel, travel restrictions make the whole uh, IPO process more complicated and of course also because we saw during the pandemic this crazy bullishness for a lot of the tech stocks and that meant that few companies who are already considering an IPO wanted to take advantage of that sort of positive macro um, sentiment. Yeah, and specs were helping them get there. So that's just a brief roundup of what a spec is. <clears throat> In the case of Grab, I mentioned Altimeter, which is a reputable and experienced US investor. Um, and the merger valued Grab at around about 40 billion, which is more than two and a half what it was what the previous known valuations was. And you know that always raises questions, is this fair? Is it too much? Is it too little? Um, but in the end, you know, when you try to figure out valuation, uh, fairness or unfairness, uh, there, there are ways of trying to estimate um, how it stacks up or compares to other companies' valuations. But in reality, none of that is very scientific. So in the end, you know, if you do talk to people who are more or less, uh, yeah, they, they would just say it's, it's in, in this kind of market, it becomes peer valuation because the money is there, the investment appetite is there. So you just kind of look at who else has already listed see in this case the other Southeast Asia company um, that's already gone public a few years ago it was doing extremely well during the pandemic and was had a market cap of 120 130 billion at some point and you know then the consideration just becomes can we argue that grab is worth you know a third or a quarter of that or or whatever so yeah um in, in this kind of climate, there is a lot of uncertainty. Um, and the spec in particular, I mean, the way a lot of specs these days are constructed, it does try to signal that there is a bit less risk that the whole thing inflates immediately. Uh, and for example, in this case, we had a bunch of investor, high profile investors commit to a so-called uh, pipe, which is an investment. It's like a placement in an IPO where uh, investors can um, sort of get in on the deal early for a good price, but they also um, are required to stay locked up in, in this for three years. That means they you know, can't sell off immediately. And yeah, so it enables backers to get in at a good price, but also signals a bit of um, yeah, certainty to other retail investors that you know, there are other people invested there in this as well and, and will stay there for a few years at least. Um, <clears throat> what was interesting for us as journalists from this whole process was, you know, dealing with private companies for many years, even though they had raised so much money, even though the stakes were so high, uh, we could never really fully understand how these companies are actually doing in terms of their finances and still with the SPAC mechanism, what companies have to disclose to do this is no, nowhere near uh, as detailed as what they would have to disclose if they went the traditional IPO um, way. But we do have a little bit of information from Altimeter's uh, filings with the SEC that don't give a view onto Grab's historical financial performance, but a little bit of where it's at now and where it's projecting to be in the future. 
and you can see here, I don't know if that's decipherable from where you're sitting, but uh, basically, you know, obviously Grab is still operating at a, at a pretty significant loss, even though the losses are, are improving uh, here on the 2020 uh, bar, which is somewhere in the middle, the loss, the net losses had, had gone, had, had become less than in the 2019 year, which was a very big growth year for, for Grab. Um, and yeah, you can see uh, on the right side of that chart, the EBITDA, which is a metric that's not exactly like net profits, but it gives a measure of how healthy the business is. And in general, you would want, you know, EBITDA to be in the, in the positive, not in the negative. And you can see that most of Grab's business lines are still EBITDA negative, except for the transportation and mobility uh, um, segment, which sort of turned EBITDA profitable in 2019, or EBITDA positive, sorry. And yeah, so projected Grab expects the EBITDA of um, deliveries and yeah, actually only deliveries to also become EBITDA positive uh, by, by next year or by this year, throughout this year. Um, obviously like deliveries also saw a huge demand spike uh, in the pandemic. Yeah, and these are just um, metrics that we will have to watch, you know, whether Grab can stick to its projections um, and whether these figures continue to trend up to see whether how Grab, you know, makes, fulfills its promise that this is a profitable uh, business model. Um, Oh yeah, another chart that I brought with you, these are from our story about Grab spec, is some other data that we'd found in the filing uh, about Grab's subsidies. Um, one of the criticisms of this business model is that it basically works only if the platform itself spends money on getting users to use all these services because you know if it actually costs the true cost of having just a coffee delivered to my doorstep may be a cost that i'm in the end not willing to pay uh, and i would only do that if if it's if someone else is eating the cost basically and we can see that grab discloses you know it's spending on these kinds of subsidies or incentives that are in excess of what they actually earn from commissions. And you can see that they're actually trending down quite significantly. So Grab was able to put the plug on those kinds of spendings a little bit, um, but they're still at a significantly higher level than, than let's say Uber's is, which you can see in the, in the compar comparison bar for down there. Um, yeah, that's another metric to watch, you know, how far can Grab take those down or will they actually have to increase incentives again if um, competition heats up again, you know, either with GoTo or with Shopee, who is also now approaching into the... into the... Um, sorry. I'm just seeing that that I, I have to speed this up a bit. So, but we'll have time to get back to this when uh, we have our Q and A part. So, go to you know the Indonesian supergroup. The merger of Gojek and Tokopedia was another huge uh, news item from um, just. What, when was it? How long was it ago? It feels like it was just last week, but maybe two weeks ago. Anyway, those two had been rumored to be in uh, uh, merger talks for, for quite a while, and then they finally made the announcement. And the beauty of just saying, oh, now we're all merging and we're just part of the same group is 
suddenly you're reporting uh, all your figures together and suddenly you're almost as big in most of these metrics, if not even bigger than, than a grab, right? Um, so in terms of the trans numbers of transactions, uh, Gojek and Tokopedia combined are, are almost on par with Grab, which is interesting because Gojek and Tokopedia are operating mainly only in Indonesia, whereas Grab is, you know, is available across Southeast Asia. So this chart just to illustrate how just at face value, uh, Gojek and Tokopedia kind of measure up to, to grab. Uh, I'll skip this one, this will take too long. Um, but in my, um, in my interpretation, the strength of GoTo and where it has a slight edge over grab when it comes to Indonesia is, is the financial services aspect. So you have GoPay, the mobile wallet, you have Midtrans, you have Mocha. Uh, these are all elements or different services that are part of a sort of financial services stack that Gojek has built and acquired over time. And it's actually quite strong and all those parts are working together in providing this financial services stack specifically for uh, small businesses and also large businesses. Uh, and now Gojek also has a digital bank. So in this aspect, Grab doesn't really have that same uh, strength in Indonesia. Uh, it does have a stake in OVO, but the other owner of OVO is Tokopedia. So it's, it's a complication what's going to happen there next. Uh, and Tokopedia may have to sell its stake in OVO because it can't really uh, directly own two of these uh, licenses for these mobile uh, money wallets. And, you know, Grab might want to acquire that stake, but Tokopedia may not necessarily like make it easy or want to let go of it that fast, right? Because you wouldn't necessarily want to sell to your, your competitor. Uh, and what could be a solution to this if, is if MTech, um, the parent company of Bukalapak, maybe comes in to acquire that stake and fulfill the merger between OVO and Dana. I think we've actually probably already spoken about this in a previous session. So let's move on. Uh, GoTo is also going to go public. Um, and for the longest time, Tokopedia was in talks with its own SPAC. But I think actually like this, this merger has, has taken that off the table for now. And from conversations I've had, it seems like that GoTo is actually seeking a traditional IPO instead, which will take longer. But um, the spec window of opportunity that was so uh, buzzy and so hot for a while is actually maybe already closing. So um, whether GoTo rushes it within the next four or five months or just waits a little longer may not be that relevant anymore. Um, and that I made this slide to summarize what I think we can see has now become the Southeast Asia playbook where internet companies here, they tend to branch out into these core, three core verticals, specifically rides, food, e-commerce, and financial services, um, which builds up a base of a high volume of users, a high volume of transactions, you know, that are daily transactions or even several times a day, uh, combined with transactions that are of higher value through e-commerce. Um, uh, these platforms need to fight for dominance in the market so that eventually these subsidies that eat away profitability can be eased out. Uh, there'll be ancillary services like advertising and search and so on that bring additional revenue. And then, you know, the, the holy grail or what awaits at the end is to just sell financial services like loans and insurances. Um, um, making use of what they've built up in terms of user data and merchant data. And yeah, so shall we go to the Q&A uh, part? I think we can use the Q&A sure. to dive 
to dig deeper into into some of those things. Yeah, thanks Nadine for, for uh, giving us this overview. Um, and thanks to uh, Norcham to invite us at Invest to take part in this exciting presentation. Uh, so I just want to ask a few questions for everyone else that want to ask, please just post it in the Q&A section, uh, message us directly, whatever you want to do. Uh, if you want to talk, I think also Magnus will be very happy if you can uh, present your question uh, in with audio. Um, so, so basically Indonesia, right? Uh, 270 million people, the world's fourth, big, fourth biggest country in terms of population. I think what we're seeing here is that tech is really revolutionizing uh, you know, the economy and how people uh, live and work it is super interesting. Uh, the kind of merged entity or go to claims to actually touch 2% of Indonesia's GDP themselves, which shows how massive uh, these new companies and this new merger uh, is. Mm -hmm. are. Um, could, could you tell us a bit? I mean, I, I'm, I'm working for Cocoon Capital, so we are an early stage seed investor in in tech companies, including Indonesia, where we have uh, 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 now two investments very soon. Um, can you tell us, what do you see as the top three tech trends in Indonesia for 2021? Mm -hmm. Well, 2021 is already half over, so... Um, 22. <laughs> yeah, so maybe if we, if we kind of make the window a little bit bigger because it's always hard to predict if it's just like a few months time frame, right? But I think uh, one thing that I expect to see more of, especially with GoTo, is uh, uh, groceries and other uh, shopping categories that are on demand, you know, basically um, combining the powers of Tokopedia and GoTo in that we can uh, basically order anything that we want uh, instantly at our fingertips. And I think that GoTo will, has, has the, the right uh, ingredients to try to make that happen, right? So groceries and other on-demand deliveries. The other thing that I expect to see more of is all that what has to do with empowering SMEs that's very high on the government agenda as well. And we have seen those kinds of startups like like Super and also like Buku, uh, Buku Warung, Buku Kas raising quite significant amounts of money. And while they have very vastly different models of how they are trying to attack or crack or work with uh, mm -hmm. the micro retail, uh, I think um, that's definitely like some seg segment where I would expect also unicorn to emerge one day, maybe not yet, not, not yet next year, but the funding is definitely getting very hot in that area. And then okay. the third thing I would say is maybe Oof, yeah, continuing the trend of what we see now, you know, companies finally going public, uh, creating uh, a bit of a reality check, you know, like we'll eventually finally see how, how is Grab really uh, accepted by the market? Will, the, will, will they buy into it? You know, what's going to happen with C? Is C going to continue uh, making people so bullish? Um, and yeah, I think that's that's a good sort of development that we have now. We'll we'll have okay. more transparency and more sure. comparables, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, let's stay with Indonesia for a moment, right? Mm -hmm. um, some people claim that Grab and Gojek are really going after the financial sector, right, to become <clears throat> more or less a, a super bank. Do you agree with that? Is that the ultimate game for Grab, perhaps on a more regional level? Gojek and Tokopedia merging, perhaps starting more with Indonesia. Is, is the game really about financial services or how much is true? I mean, I think so, yeah. If you do, I mean, if you look at who, which are the most profitable companies in Indonesia, it's it's a lot of the banks are, are right mm -hmm. up there, right? Um, um, and I think understanding that Indonesia still has so many uh, underserved people who are not really touched by or not really served well by by banks the way they are now I think there is a big opportunity and tech companies are in the position where they can use their their data advantage to make smarter decisions about who they lend to so I think at least in theory you know that's 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 the that's the path everybody wants to go it's 
and financial has shown in China that it kind of works. Uh, so yeah, I think that you could say that that's correct. You know, the financial services is where eventually all the groundwork that's been laid through getting users, getting data, getting transactions will eventually like uh, pay off. So that's an interesting perspective. Uh, ju just saying, my last question I have in general for Indonesia. Um, Indonesia seems to now start to become the like hotbed of, of tech innovation in, in Southeast mm -hmm. Asia. It, it has to definitely, I mean, almost more than 40% of the entire population in one country. Uh, so it, it definitely serves as an extremely good place to, to start uni uh, unicorns in terms of the consumer space. Um, where's the government in all of this? What, what does the government of Indonesia have to do, you think, to uh, attract even more capital um, to, to make sure that you can operate multi-billion companies in tech in Indonesia in a, in a safe right. and predictable way? Mm. I mean, so far, you know, the government at least hasn't stood in the way of this happening, I think. It's, it's a bit of a tough question. I think they've you know, signaled very strongly that it's, the administration is very pro-tech development. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the government is, is, is you know, in many ways like, very open to public-private partnerships in this, in this sector as well and giving contracts to start, small startups, um, which maybe in other countries wouldn't necessarily be, be possible. Um, but I mean, there's there's two big problems in Indonesia still quite unsolved, right? Which is on the side of the ease of doing business and this the stability or security that companies, foreign co foreign owned companies especially have in terms of their uh, legal uh, representation here. I think you yeah. hear still hear that a lot that if something goes wrong uh, and you do end up having to face legal issues, you know, there's very few avenues of actually um, like going going through with that. So I think right. that that's still an area where it's just very difficult for foreign companies to hear to really feel uh, feel right. secure in making business here. And, and this and forces other, obviously a lot of them to have headquarters in Singapore for that reason, right? And, and you think yeah, that would be yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, for tax reasons, for ease of doing business, for legal certainty, and so on. I yep. think that's very difficult to, that mindset is probably very difficult to change because Singapore is also doing so much to keep it that, I mean, to be that place where it, where those things are given and easy, right? Yeah. So to, to I mean, in, yeah, in the interest of time, I think we should just move on to the graph. Uh, okay. Or did you want to add something else? No, I wanted to add the, the second part about the, the problems companies face growing in Indonesia is definitely the talent shortage problem that uh, what from what we hear, and I think we talked about this a little bit last time, um, it's just very difficult to build large teams and you see Gojek as well as every, every tech right. firm that's successful in Indonesia has a large quarter uh, or, or tech headquarter elsewhere, whether that's in China, whether that's in India. Um, because recruiting here, first you don't find the talent and because it is so scarce, it's very, it's quite expensive to hire here. So that's a solution that's, uh, that many have had to come up with is to just have tech centers uh, outside of Indonesia. Mm. That's a very interesting point. <clears throat> the social discrepancy between the market opportunity and the people that can actually build. Yes. Yeah. The tech. Mm -hmm. um, moving on to the, the Grab's upcoming SPAC from Altimeter. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask you something from, from your perspective that, you know, you know Indonesia really well. Uh, you know, for us coming from uh, Europe, um, we're not really, we don't understand these super apps uh, as well as, as uh, uh, you do in Asia. Um, it seems like both Grab and, and Gojek and Tokopedia want to create super apps and expand what they're doing. Um, do, you, do you see any danger in, in, in pursuing that? If you look at Uber, they have kind of really focused and cut down on what they're doing and are focusing almost exclusively on, on transportation and, and deliveries. Mm -hmm. um, while Grab and, and GoTo seem to want to kind of compete on becoming the go-to app uh, so to speak for everything. Yeah. Um, 
is, is that a good strategy given all the other competitors uh, that they are facing in the various verticals? How do you think this is gonna play out? Now you're gonna, you're gonna have two basically large companies with lots of funding and you have uh, already Lazada, C, and you also have Amazon mm -hmm. waiting in the world. Yeah, I mean, that that's from anything that I can observe and see it. I think the super app model is kind of the Southeast Asian way. Uh, it's not exactly super app uh, in the way that that uh, that China has has WeChat and and all the other uh, mini apps attached to it. That's that's not exactly how it's playing out here. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's definitely like one app for multi purposes um, and from what I hear, why this is the, the most simple explanation is basically that people have phones where they can't, you know, entertain too many apps at the same time because of limits of, of storage, limits of, um, of just like the device computing capacity and so on. And which is why they'll have four or five apps uh, on a phone. And then that's basically it. So each app must really have a full uh, range of of services and you also have a relatively short time frame to build brand names here right because things are moving so fast so that means that when you first know uh go to or you know the brand grab those will be one of the few brands people know because they many of them recently got online so i think it's not also a, a result of the speed at which the internet is developing which was much much slower in the us and europe perhaps but this is a kind of a meta question uh, well, I think almost like when it comes to uh, branding and accepting uh, new brands, I would actually say Indonesian consumers are very open to accepting new brands as long okay. as, you know, maybe okay. also because there are so many young people just growing up and just making their first uh, experiences coming online and buying online. And maybe that's what makes them very open to new brands. But Okay. So my, my question, my, my, my understanding of that is not correct. Then. That's interesting. Um, that's a good point. A lot of people are very young and a big, big part of internet users are less than 30 years old, right? And it's probably the youngest yeah. internet population in, in the world. Um, going back to the um, transaction without the altimeter and, and thanks for explaining SPACs and how this works. And it's definitely a great way for tech companies in Southeast Asia to suddenly list on exchanges mm -hmm. far away without having to travel. Um, why do you think the promoters added a three-year lockup what was that perhaps because they don't want to have pressure to sell because they probably perhaps overpaid for a deal? Or do you see any other reason that that very unexpectedly and long lockup was, was mm -hmm. introduced? I mean, you, you usually see lockups, but they're usually more in the range of a year, not three mm -hmm. years. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe that has to do with a little bit. I think if the lockup were very sh relatively short, that would probably like just make people even more skeptical about the the valuation so mm -hmm. yeah, i think i think what you said is actually quite correct you know i mean i wouldn't say is is the valuation too high it's definitely a, a covid bubble valuation you know there's no sort of doubt about that and whether that can sustain or not you know that we'll just have to wait and see on that one if it's a bubble it cannot be sustained by definition <laughs> <laughs> that's true a bubble can't be sustained by definition yeah uh, one one last question we have from Cocoon's side. I mean, you look at Amazon or even you know old companies like Yahoo or or Uber. Um, what is different in both Grab and this new entity of GoTo is that the initial founders have so little equity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for Grab, it's like an, an enormously interesting. I, I think that Anthony at Grab owns two point two percent of the company after the SPAC. And he has managed to retain more than 50% voting rights, but financially he's only incentivized at 2.2% of the company. How can management kind of act in interest of the stockholders in the long term when they are basically highly paid management and not the kind of type of founder you normally see in uni unicorns in, in the West? Mm -hmm. I don't actually know if that's a, that's a question I can fully answer and maybe you can help me answer that as well, but. I mean, the Anthony Tan case, as far as I know, is quite uh, extreme with the 2%. Um, I'm not sure what it's the typical percentage for founders in the West, um, but 
I mean, what I think of here, people are often first time founders. They never really thought themselves go from starting their first startup, you know, in their twenties to suddenly being the CEO of a, a multi-billion dollar entity that's that's about to, to be on the NASDAQ, right? So I think for a lot of them, it was like such a wild ride and mm. they got very diluted along the way, taking in these crazy funding rounds. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, I don't know if that's just like speculation, but yeah, the finance, that a little bit the financial returns, it goes through. I think you're right. But I, but I think I, yeah. than they ever imagined. And they have this suddenly like this power and respect and open doors to investors in Silicon Valley. They're meeting Masayoshi Son, they're, they're doing this, they're doing that. And they yeah. just have in their mind, you know, I'm, our, you know, in my next, in my next venture, I'm going to be a tougher negotiator for this. Yeah, and I think you're right. And also, I think it is, it is there is a regional discount in, in Southeast Asia for companies. I think that's also been something Grab would have seen. If Grab had started in Silicon Valley, they probably would have gotten a much higher valuation for each of their rounds. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at Jeff Bezos, I think he owns something like 11% of Amazon still, mm -hmm. uh, which is quite extraordinary. Uh, so I think it's also a result of the fact that they had to raise in multiple number of rounds for yeah. a lot of it different investors. And you also look at the cap table of both the companies, they actually include a number of all the large investors, including, you know, even from the Singapore government to, to large PE firms. Um, should we move on to the Gojek and Tokopedia merger? I mean, any questions from the audience? Uh, I see you are here. We want to hear what, what do you think? What do you want to, want to have answer? Is a unique chance to ask Nadine everything or anything? Um, uh, while we wait for that, let, let's go and speak about GoTo a little bit. That, that's creating this, uh, probably what is now going to be the biggest internet company in Indonesia. So it's quite significant. Um, do you think they were kind of forced to do something like this? Because Gojek is not exactly uh, a, a rocket ship uh, compared to Grab, uh, right? It's like the number two. And in some market, they're not even that present. And it kind of mm -hmm. operates at, at the discount, both in terms of price and and, and valuation. Do, do you think they were kind of forced to do a merger with, with, a, with an e-commerce platform? Because it's not very necessarily uh, an expected move to move to, to, move to actually merge and, 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 and be diluted at that level with, with an e-commerce platform that they could probably build by themselves. Hmm. Mm, I mean, it took Tokopedia 10 years to build Tokopedia, right? And and I think it took Shopee, I mean, it took Shopee a shorter time to build it, but it also yeah. spent a huge amount of money that it had. So I think for Gojek to build it out from scratch, it's not really that easy, you know, just in terms of um, the capital it would need to raise to do that. So I think in in some ways, I mean, yeah, you, you have, you have, you, you mentioned some perspectives that, that see this critically uh, I kind of think Gojek had to do something after the merger talks with Grab fell through, right? That was an, another constellation that was quite advanced talks, but then they couldn't really agree uh, on certain terms of leadership. And with Togopedia, it just uh, must have been a much easier negotiation. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it means financially for the top management and the board and the shareholders, but uh, I think they did gain something through aligning uh, in this way. Mm. I mean, especially okay. again, if we see financial services as, as the end goal, because you do have a different type of uh, micro entrepreneur on e-commerce platforms than you have in rides and food delivery, right? You have people sure. who can grow their businesses, who have uh, businesses that are just higher margin, who are more stable, who you can give loans to, who can expand their business. So I think for, especially for Tokopedia, especially for Gojek, if you see Gojek as a fintech company, which I think it, it, it kind of is because uh, Go, everything that's under GoPay is actually a very interesting proposition and very strong. Um, um, yeah, so if you see Gojek more as a fintech company than for its ride and food delivery, then maybe the combination with Tokopedia makes more sense. So what's the next big merger or acquisition that in, in Southeast Asia? Is it Amazon buying Grab 
because based on what you just said, it seems like the most likely next step, right? Uh, I mean, if Amazon really comes, it will just be, I don't think they will do it through acquisition, right? They will just fight it out themselves like in India. But I think that, I don't know, I don't know. It's been, it's been on the, it's been rumored so many times and they just haven't made that move yet. I don't know what Amazon's plans are for, for Southeast Asia right now. But I think in terms of other big alignments, I think, you know, Grab, Lazada, could somehow, <laughs> Lazada, uh, you know, there's some investor DNA that's, that's aligned with Alibaba. And um, if e-commerce and ride hailing and financial services can uh, be mutually beneficial to each other, maybe there's some sort of alignment possible there or with Bukalapak in Indonesia even. I think maybe right. that's, that's even more likely. Interesting. Uh, the last thing I want to ask you about GoTo, uh, Magnus, uh, if you allow me, is like, what do you think GoTo is going to do? Are they going to fight it out in Indonesia and become the biggest one there? Or do you think they're going <clears> to <throat> keep on trying to become a full-fledged regional competitor on Grab? Um, I think they're going to quite strong, strictly focus on Indonesia for now. Yeah. I think, I mean, they won't retreat from the other countries, that's, that's sure, but I think they'll try to sort of understand how e-commerce and their financial services can play together in Indonesia and then take that uh, to the region, I think. So, so the merger with Tokopedia is kind of a focus back on Indonesia again, because obviously Tokopedia has no footprint outside Indonesia. Yeah, it's never gone outside, yeah. 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 Magnus, over to you. Thanks. Now, I, guess, I guess Indonesia is the crown jewel, right? In, in Southeast Asia, it seems to me at least. Um, so, so I have one question uh, regarding uh, C versus go to. Um, so, so from my experience in Indonesia, um, there is for some reason a, a strong advantage to be the local player rather than being the foreign investor. There's some kind of regu regulatory arbitrage, mm -hmm. um, which uh, I'm trying to be polit politically correct now because it's on, on the record. <laughs> But uh, for some reason, local players, um, they, they do better than foreign players in, in many cases. So do you think uh, shareholders of C mm -hmm. uh, with Shopee should be, uh, should be scared of this, this merger because now they're this strong homegrown unicorn. Mm -hmm. And of course, they have better connections in, in, the, in the parliament and in the politicians and, and they know their ways around Indonesia better than a Singapore for an investor. And mm -hmm. full disclosure, I'm, I'm betting on the fall of C stock price in the market. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, cu I'm curious about that um, because there is like a, a, some kind of regulatory arbitrage that we've seen a lot in the history of Indonesia that local companies, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is that is a question for me or for Will? It's it's for you, um, Will. You feel feel free to answer if you. Uh, Nadine, Nadine, go for it. <laughs> oh man, yeah, these are so hard to to. I mean, but if you do look at how Shopee has performed in Indonesia, it's actually like a counter uh, example of what you just said, right? Because Shopee has, in many uh, respects, um, actually outperformed Tokopedia. Um, so, and it's, it came later, it's the foreigner, um, but it does have, you know, Indonesian people on its board and it has, uh, you know, Pandu Shahir uh, as the, who, who, who is like an influential person here in the Indonesian business ecosystem as well as political ecosystem, which is always a good person to have, right? Um, so I think, that not necessarily the foreign company is at a disadvantage perhaps if, if it doesn't get those people who are important to on its side. But I think Shopee has shown that it is possible. And if anything, go to is a reaction to Shopee becoming so strong and Shopee delivery uh, that's kind of the defensive move more more than something that Shopee needs to be scared of. At this. 
So uh, from my perspective of uh, the Indonesian consumer behavior, I, I see the Indonesian consumer as extremely price sensitive. I mean, I know so many people every day, they take uh, a ride, ride hauling, uh, ride hailing to, to the office and they will open up both apps, both Grab and Gojek, which one is cheaper and then they take that. So they're, they're, they're so willing to trade their time in exchange for saving some money. And I think uh, from my perspective, Shopee has basically been throwing more money at uh, subsidizing the consumer than Tokopedia. And that's gonna be interesting to see what happens when the money dries up, right? Um, that's that's but, um, true, but, but C's money is, is less likely to dry up than, than go to's at this point, right? Um, C, C is still, uh, has, has a profitable business with Garena and um, for them, the, the, the flywheel of subsidizing uh, delivery and subsidizing um, e-commerce to some degree, it can basically continue forever if they manage to keep that up. So I think they're, they're in actually like a pretty, pretty good position uh, in Southeast Asia still. So I talked to a friend in, in, um, in one of the other e-commerce companies in Indonesia, mm -hmm. and he said that the problem is that uh, Shopee's uh, sees e-commerce business is growing much faster than their gaming business. Mm -hmm. And the e-commerce business is extremely unprofitable now. The gaming business is very profitable, yeah. but it's, it's moving kind of in the wrong direction, right? Because Shopee is growing so fast, but it's every single rupee they sell, they lose more money. Operational loss, right? Uh, I guess gross loss. Yeah, that's that's what true. It's, it's it's certainly very aggressive, you know, and that's something that Tokopedia has maybe lacked for a while. Now Shopee is going to Brazil, and Brazil is a super interesting market in the turn in the way that people spend on e-commerce. It's like it's like so, it's like a the average basket size in Brazil is like almost as high as in the U.S. Um. Yeah, so I think you know that's something that Tokopedia never really quite touched or thought about, and and see, in my view, you know, is much more a really global player than any of the Southeast Asian companies. Interesting. Um, so um, that's going to be interesting to follow. One question I have for both of you actually is something that I've been thinking a little bit about: uh, the question about why are there so many super apps in Asia and not in the Western world? And I've been thinking, could one reason be that since the ease of doing business is so bad, you need to have a certain scale in order to do things. So, so um, that's why we see more specialization in Europe and the US. And here, as long as you get a little bit of a scale, you might as well also do e-commerce. You might as well also do mm -hmm. wallets uh, because it's so hard to do business. It's just I mean, uh, something one thing, like hard to do business, but also like everything is such a low margin business, right? The 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 the, the, the complaint is always the the value of what people buy is very low, right? Basket sizes are small. That makes it only possible to do everything at a high volume, and that makes just that starts this rationale that you have to build a business that's serving large volume rather than. Uh, one where you go for like better margins. To jump in on that, I think one big difference is that the Southeast Asian Revolution started <clears throat> with people accessing the internet on their mobile phones. And as Nadine mentioned before, people don't like to install too many apps. The fact is that once you have installed an app on your phone, it, you, you, you become a very sticky customer. So Again, uh, it's, it's expensive to get people to download new apps. Uh, Nadine, you said that people are open to explore different companies. But I think if you combine all of these things, because as soon as you have an app on your phone, you will use that app much, much more than if you access the same service through a direct web uh, access. True. And then the, the point from, from you, Magnus, I think is very valid. Yes, trust is much, much lower in Southeast Asia than in the US or Europe, or perhaps even China, because so many times I've ordered things online when I came here and, and something wrong happens or you can't return the goods or there's no good customer service, for example. So, so by embracing multiple services on, in, in the brand, like, like, like for example, what e-commerce platforms do, 
it, it's a fast way to bring a lot of retailers up to becoming online retailers. At the same time, you kind of provide that layer of customer courtesy or service that they are not ab able to or not willing to mm -hmm. uh, provide themselves. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you for that perspective. So I think we're, we're kind of running out of time here, but uh, would you like to use some closing remarks? Um, any of you or any question, last question from the audience here? And then we're going to close. <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll leave the closing to Nadine. <laughs> That's unfair. Uh, I'll, I'll close with asking you a short question, Will. Like, as, a, as an early stage investor in, based in Singapore, um, what, how are you viewing the current situation that's playing out? Is it becoming easier or harder to identify you know, which companies, startups to invest in in Indonesia and to get into those deals? Indonesia is <clears throat> definitely extremely interesting. I, I think we touched upon the lack of tech talent there. Um, and we also touched upon the prices. I mean, obviously for us as early stage investors, we would like Southeast Asia to, to, to get rid of its regional discount. We would like companies in Southeast Asia to be priced uh, at the same level as their kind of counterparts in, in China or the US and Europe. So, so having these enormous unicorn uh, listings or mergers are, uh, are basically putting Southeast Asia on the map and you show that you can actually get decent or amazing valuations of tech in Southeast Asia. So that's, that's good news. The, the problem I think for Indonesia in particular is that there has been so much money coming into it because it's such a big country, but at the same time, the companies might not be that mature. So whereas you have a, probably a price discount across Southeast Asia all the way to Singapore, uh, you have a, probably uh, an overpricing going on in Indonesia, and that makes it hard for at least an outsider investment uh, company to go into Indonesia and to feel you get a good deal because there's still risk in the country. Uh, there is massive corruption, although nobody wants to talk about that, and, but that, that's, that's a fact uh, if you listen to uh, people tracking this. And, and there is, of course, market uncertainty. And, and again, there's, there's sometimes a lack of quality in, in the tech, but there is a, an amazing young generation of Indonesians that, that create solutions and, and will bring their country forward at the pace you had never seen before. So there are so many things going on at the same time. It's a very complicated picture. Um, cool, yeah, thanks. In that, in that sense, I don't have anything further to say. I've already spoken so much. Magnus, okay. you wanna... Thanks for inviting us. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nadine. It was great to be able to ask you questions. Thank you, Will. And thank you, Magnus. You feel more or less bullish on Indonesia after this uh, this uh, webinar, uh, William? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think I'm neutral. I, I, th I, think, I think we form our opinions on an ongoing basis for all countries and it depend, depends on the sector and, and the team. I would say in Cocoon, we, we invest anywhere in Southeast Asia if the team is good. So we ha we're not that much driven by, by mm -hmm. country. Um, we also invest in a lot of companies that actually target the world. It's just that the amazing founding teams are based in Southeast Asia. Uh, if we go for one country companies, we probably would stick with Indonesia or, or Vietnam, for example. But yeah, well, I, I, le I learned a lot by, by this session. Thank you. So I'm probably a bit more bullish, <laughs> to be honest. But, but the, the, the issues I raised still remain. Sorry. Yeah. What about you, Magnus? Are you still uh, your, your short C? What does that really mean? Like, are, are you still short C, Magnus? Yeah, I'm, I'm still when do, you, when do you when do you make money then? What has to happen? Like, how far does the price have to? I mean, it's already like not on the up, 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 up anymore, right? It's so when you're shorting a company, you're you're borrowing shares from an existing shareholder. Yeah, and you I, get, I get what that means, but like, how far does it need to drop before you get your payout? I short uh, not so long ago, so it has to fall maybe five percent before I'm break even. I'm a little bit in a loss right now. I have to admit that. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think it's extremely um, highly high valuation. Um, and um, I, th I thought that last year. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs>
So now it's not going to be cheaper, right? Because now it's 9x. It's not, it went 9x, I think, on the stock exchange in the last 15 months. Yeah. The, the trouble is that this, these mergers and SPACs will basically raise the attention for Southeast Asia, and investors are not always rational. So shorting yeah. is a dangerous game. Yeah, yeah. I know. I'm going to be careful. So I think that, uh, um, thank you so much for uh, joining today. It was yeah. a really, uh, really cool session, really fun, very interesting. And I hope that you too can, can meet in person one day. Um, uh, the dust settles yeah. after uh, COVID. And uh, yeah, maybe we can do this some other, some other time as well, mm -hmm. when there's some new big developments in Indonesia, perhaps. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, as always, Magnus. And uh, great to meet you, Nadine. All the best. Have a nice day.